think uh, we uh, should get started. Uh, I think people will take maybe another minute to, to log in. Um, welcome to the uh, March webinar of the uh, Crypto and Blockchain Economics Research Forum. Um, our forum is a group of researchers um, seeking to build an interdisciplinary community of scholars uh, with the interest in the economics of blockchain and cryptocurrency digital payments, broadly speaking. Um, I do want to take a minute to mention uh, the exciting lineup we have in terms of speakers and events over the next couple months. Uh, as you know, in addition to the monthly webinar, we do have monthly symposiums on the third Thursdays of each month. So on March 18th, uh, Professor David Yermak is going to uh, host a symposium on the theme of blockchain attacks and reorganizations. And on April the 1st, uh, and uh, this, this is uh, true, uh, Prof. Uh, Mario Hara is going to host uh, Professor Goncera from the Computer Science Department uh, at Cornell uh, for our regular webinar. And most exciting uh, event in April is uh, on April the 16th and 17th, we will be hosting our very first uh, CBER conference uh, with uh, the dual submission uh, to management science and um, more information will be available. In fact, they are available on our website right now, but the program will be posted once they are um, ready. So uh, we hope you can all join and uh, you are also encouraged to submit your research and papers to the special issue on uh, blockchain and crypto economics uh, research at the management science. So uh, today I'm glad to be the host for our webinar. Uh, and we're just really happy to have uh, Itai Goldstein with us who's going to present his drawing paper with uh, Diksha Gupta and uh, Ruslan Shukovov. Uh, Svrchikov, I want to get the name correct. Um, as a world-renowned financial economist, I think Itai has uh, truly exceptional scholarship and an illustrious career, which typically do not need further introduction. Um, but today I do want to uh, take the opportunity to mention uh, a few uh, endeavors and projects that uh, he has undertaken so that we can appreciate what he's done for the profession. Um, in addition to making contributions to studies on financial fragility, crisis or feedback effects between firms and financial markets, he also co-founded the finance theory group and we were just chatting earlier that there's a uh, webinar talk for Finance Theory Group as well. Um, he served as the first president there. The group has grown to be arguably the most uh, influential uh, venue for theorists in finance to interact and collaborate these days with hundreds of uh, members. Um, more closely to our uh, crypto and blockchain forum, um, Itai has served as an editor for the review of financial studies and has been the executive editor of the uh, RFS since uh, 2018. Uh, earlier, together with uh, Andrew Karuli and Wei Zhang, they introduced the first issue on FinTech uh, at RFS that has received a wide following uh, and has cre created a big impact. He has subsequently led the journal to continue providing a uh, venue for research publications related to FinTech collaborating with uh, universities such as uh, Georgia State University, um, offering dual submission options and so on. So, so I think uh, his leadership has been truly integral for this uh, emerging field that's very important and fast growing. Um, and at the start was a bit unconventional, difficult to do research in, uh, you know, at one point. So we definitely appreciate uh, his leadership and contribution. And uh, today's format is going to be about 60 minutes, slightly under 60 minutes for the paper presentation. Uh, during the presentation, we'll have one uh, short Q&A break in the middle and one towards the end of the talk. Uh, for all the attendees, please feel free to type in your questions 
through the Q&A box. Uh, you can also type the question in the chat, but that might be um, lost if there are too many messages. Uh, so the Q&A uh, box will be the way to go. Uh, without further ado, uh, Ita, I'm just going to turn the stage over to you now and uh, uh, looking forward to your talk. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Will, for inviting me to give this talk and for the very nice and kind uh, introduction. Uh, of course, you have been an early contributor uh, to uh, this uh, literature on, on fintech and a very important part of the special issue that we did at the RFS uh, back in uh, 2019. Um, and I'm, I'm happy also to now uh, contribute as uh, an author uh, to uh, this uh, literature that I always found uh, very interesting from, from the beginning. And, and I think it, it was certainly a good uh, bet for the RFS to take at, at that time. Um, and uh, what I will present today is a theory uh, paper that, that I wrote with uh, two of the former PhD students from Wharton, uh, Diksha, who is now in uh, Carnegie, and Ruslan, who is now at uh, Warwick, uh, where uh, we uh, explore uh, some of the economic benefits of coins and, and tokens um, on online uh, platforms uh, that, that we think can uh, help uh, alleviate uh, problems uh, of a lack of, of competition that are inherent uh, to such uh, platforms. Uh, so it's uh, about initial coin offerings and as a commitment to competition. And as, as uh, Will, uh, as, as you mentioned, um, I guess I'll, I'll go for about uh, 20, 25 minutes or so, then we'll stop uh, for Q&A and, and then I will uh, continue. Uh, to the rest of, of the paper. So what I hope to achieve in, in the first half is to give you a broad introduction of what motivates this uh, paper and then uh, show you a, a quick uh, example that I think illustrates uh, the key idea. And then after the q and A, I I will uh, show sort of the main model and, and some of the extensions that I think are, are very important uh, to, to understand the applicability and, and what exactly uh, this can achieve. Um, so, um, the, the problem, I think, is well known uh, of market power of uh, technology uh, companies. And as you will see, uh, we will show that uh, tokens can be a commitment that is used by these companies to break their, their market power. Um, and, and the problem of market power of technology companies, as I mentioned, is, is well known. Uh, there is really growing concern that uh, firms like Facebook, Twitter, and Amazon, you know, these are sort of catchy examples. It's not necessarily the focus of our model, but these are catchy examples. Uh, you know, they control large platforms. Uh, everyone wants to be on the same platform. And because they are in control, they can, they can excel uh, market power and basically uh, get all, all the rents. Uh, and also uh, have negative implications for uh, efficiency. And, and there are many policy proposals that are trying to, to break up uh, these, uh, these companies. Um, of course, there will be a, a trade-off. On the one hand, uh, you, you want to go back to, to competition. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we cannot deny the fact that there are network uh, externalities that are generating positive effects to everyone being on the same uh, platform. Uh, and, and basically, uh, the argument that we will develop here is that the so-called utility uh, token that is typically used in initial coin offerings uh, can actually help reduce uh, the rents and improve uh, efficiency in two-sided online marketplaces. Um, so essentially, uh, you can kind of use that to uh, benefit from the best of both worlds, both having the uh, network externalities on one platform, uh, but also limiting uh, the negative effects of uh, market power. Um, to fix ideas, uh, think about the following uh, sort of two-sided ride-sharing uh, marketplace. You know, you can think about Uber, uh, obviously. Uh, where you have large number of users uh, that are looking for uh, rides and a large number of drivers that are providing uh, the rides. And then you have the uh, intermediary uh, uh, Uber, which is the platform that is sort of matching users and uh, drivers. Um, I think there is 
uh, really no doubt that having a, a large single platform can really be uh, effective in providing good uh, matches and these network externalities can, can really uh, be uh, lead, lead to higher uh, efficiency. You know, if you're a user that is looking for a taxi, you're not going to download uh, different uh, platforms. It's easier to uh, concentrate on, on one. Okay, and the same thing for, for the drivers that they are concentrating on, on one. Um, but uh, having this uh, single platform can also generate uh, monopoly power and, and rents. Okay, so um, the firm that is controlling the, the platform can basically uh, charge a high price from consumers, pay a low price to the providers and grab uh, the rent and also limit uh, quantity, just like in the typical uh, monopoly uh, problem. Okay. So uh, what you would like to have uh, ideally is a solution where you have a single uh, platform uh, that uh, maximizes the, the network effects, but is doing it with a competitive uh, pricing uh, that will uh, generate um, sort of the, at least approach the, the, first, the first best. Okay. And what we will show here is that um, this kind of optimal solution can actually be achieved in the long run through uh, utility uh, tokens, whereby uh, the firm that is operating the, the platform uh, is um, providing those tokens and those tokens will be the only way uh, to get the service or the product uh, on, on the platform. And then those tokens are being traded in, in a secondary market. Um, the way to think about it is uh, you start out with um, a, a chunk of, of tokens and then you release them so that people can uh, get those uh, services. But every time you release those tokens, those tokens essentially go out to the uh, secondary market and being traded. So every time you uh, provide those tokens for people to be able to get services, you give up a chunk of your market power. And this is kind of a commitment that over time you will give up more and more of your market power, eventually in the long run approaching sort of the competitive uh, equilibrium, okay? Um, and, and, you know, we discussed that in the paper, uh, a lot of it looks a lot like uh, what you see in uh, sort of the, uh, the ICOs, uh, the initial coin offerings and uh, the tokens that are issued and then used uh, through them, okay? Um, a word about ICOs, so, you know. So, Ita, if I, get, I mean, just for clarification, since you started with this nice Uber example, mm -hmm. could you perhaps uh, say how that would work if Uber had, you know, proceeded this way? Um, what would Uber have offered as an I, I, I call? Yeah, so so you could imagine Uber issuing uh, a bunch of, of coins um, and then consumers uh, who want to use those services uh, will have to buy those coins in order to get the services. Um, they will um, buy those, essentially pay for the service with the coins and pay the producers, okay? Um, and then those coins are gonna be in circulation. So the producers, in order to get paid for the service, they will have to sell uh, the coins in the secondary market to the next generation of uh, users uh, and eventually what will happen is that Uber will now be in competition with uh, those providers. So the new coins will come from Uber and from uh, the providers who are selling the coins that they bought previously. Okay, so basically yeah, yeah. In, instead of Uber controlling the whole thing, you will now have Uber competing with, uh, with its future self, with, with its former self in some sense. Just to complete that, the, the, the price the, the price in coin of a ride in the car, who sets that? How is it so set? That, that will be fixed. Uh, so we basically say that when you initiate uh, the platform and issue the coins, you know, you put it kind of as a smart contract if you want that um, in order to get a ride, you will need to pay one coin. The thing that is changing over time will be the price of the coin in dollars, okay? and, and that will be an important uh, part of, of the solution. And, and you know, we kind of say, 
not all ICOs looked like that. So it's not, we're not necessarily saying that the way that ICOs have been designed in the past has been uh, really optimal. But I think a lot of the features are there and um, you know, having this fixed rate of exchange, if you want, between a coin and a service is actually important. Uh, if you don't have that, then uh, the, the, the competition will be uh, driven away of, over time. I mean, not, not to elaborate on that too much, but since this example is so beautiful, um, <laughs> I mean, Uber offers a platform, right? Offers its matching services and charges something for that, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, another way to go is that the coin is really for that platform service, that if you have a coin, you know, you, you get to match, whereas the price that, mm -hmm. that is the contract between the, the, the rider and the driver, and mm -hmm. that could be emerging due to something else. I mean, I think it's a fascinating okay. question, but probably beyond the paper, how you would yes. set that up with an right. ICO. Yeah, no, fair enough, yes. Um, so let, let me say uh, a word here about ICOs because uh, at the moment it's not a super happy uh, story. Um, I think uh, the market for ICOs uh, has boomed, uh, but also generated huge regulatory concerns um, because I think with all the potential good in it, there was probably a big chunk of bad activities and fraud and all sorts of things like that. And it kind of hit the regulatory roadblock and, and now not as much is, is going on. And I think sort of people are still waiting for more uh, regulatory clarity to sort of know how to, to move on from, uh, from there. Um, so I, I want to be clear, you know, um, I think this is still in development. Um, I think uh, what we point out is there is uh, potentially an, a nice important use case for, for ICOs, uh, which I think is quite relevant because for most of these platforms, uh, the issue of uh, monopoly and the problems that come with it immediately uh, come, uh, come to mind. Um, so we don't, we, we, I think, you know, we're still thinking where this paper is exactly between the positive and, and the normative. Uh, happy to hear more, uh, more thoughts about that. Um, but we certainly have some things to say that are more positive in nature and some things to say that are more uh, normative in, in nature. Okay, um, I'll, I'll skip uh, the literature. There's a lot of literature on ICOs and many people who are attending here uh, have uh, contributed. Uh, there is some relation to an old literature on durable goods uh, monopolist and the idea that when you are uh, providing a durable good, um, you have this sort of competition between what you do now and what you do in the future and kind of limits your ability to exert market power. And I think the nice insight here is that, you know, we are talking about services that are not uh, durable, um, but the tokens essentially make them uh, durable in, in some sense. Okay, so I, I think it sort of uh, connects back to this old, older literature on durable good uh, monopolies. So let me uh, now jump into uh, an illustrative uh, example, uh, sort of a two period uh, example with two types of consumers that I think illustrates the, the idea uh, pretty well. Um, and and uh, the, the model, as you will see later, is much more uh, general than that, but I think you can get the gist with a two period example before I move on to uh, the full model. So let's say that there are two periods, uh, one and two, and say that uh, there are three types of risk neutral uh, agents. Uh, you have the entrepreneur who develops uh, the, the platform uh, to match providers and consumers. Uh, think about it as Uber. Don't wanna hang my head too much on Uber. You can think about other examples as well. You know, Filecoin is one that we mentioned in the paper where uh, you can buy storage to put your files from other people who have storage available. So, so you can think about various uh, things. Um, um, you, you have uh, competitive providers of the service who produce uh, the service at a cost of, of C. And, and you have a measure, uh, of, uh, measure one of heterogeneous consumers who value consuming one unit of uh, service every period at uh, different uh, levels. Um, so you, uh, you have alpha H of them that have high value of the service VH and alpha L that have low value of the service uh, VL. And, and here uh, I'm gonna say that, you know, alpha H and alpha L stay, stay the same across the two periods, but in the paper, we also extend it to 
sort of uncertain uh, demands and those things changing over time or growing over time. Um, and the assumption is that VH uh, is greater than VL is greater than C. So you can imagine that the optimal allocation would be that everyone gets to uh, consume uh, the service. <clears throat> so this is sort of uh, graphically, you have VH, uh, alpha H of the consumers uh, enjoy the value of VH, alpha L enjoy the value of VL, and both of them are above uh, C. Um, and, and now let, let's think about sort of the entrepreneur as a monopolist. Um, um, the, the entrepreneur will set prices to charge consumers and reimburse providers. And basically uh, providers here are competitive. So he will just pay them uh, the cost of C and then he will decide how much to charge uh, from the consumers. Uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, either he charges uh, VH, and so there will be only alpha H uh, consumers who get the service, or he charges VL, and then he's going to serve all consumers. The first one is inefficient. The second one is the efficient uh, allocation. Uh, but obviously, for some parameters, uh, the monopolist will choose uh, the first one, right? Um, and this is the set of parameters that we will focus on. Um, which uh, obviously creates a distortion from having a, a monopolist. Uh, and you can, you can see it here. Uh, so basically what he will choose to do is basically every period uh, just charge VH for the service uh, from uh, the consumers and serve alpha H, okay? He will do the same thing at time one and the same thing at time two. There is essentially no um, effect here of what you do in time one on time two, you treat each period uh, separately, okay? So that, that would be sort of the inefficiency coming out of uh, the, the monopolist. Um, and what I wanna think now in, in the context of this example is what happens if you introduce uh, tokens um, and here is how we think about it. So uh, going back to the question about what is the price of a service in terms of token, say that each token can be exchanged for one service. Uh, obviously it doesn't have to be one, but what's important is that this is uh, fixed. So initially when you set it up, you say uh, you need this number of tokens uh, for a service. Um, those uh, tokens are gonna be bought and sold in the resale market at a price PT uh, at, in, times one and two, uh, and PT will be determined uh, in equilibrium. Uh, and uh, providers can redeem the tokens with the entrepreneur for a price uh, C at the end of time two. So we set it up so that, you know, if you're dealing with finite horizon, they need to be able to get it, uh, to get their money back in the final period. Otherwise the whole thing unravels. Um, but uh, before, before the end, they will basically sell their tokens in uh, the secondary uh, market, okay? So uh, basically what happens is in terms of a timeline, uh, in time one, there is a token market. The entrepreneur is gonna sell uh, a quantity that he chooses Q1 of the tokens. Consumers are gonna buy the tokens for a price of P1. Um, then consumers will get the service in exchange uh, for the token. Uh, providers will receive the token. Then consumers consume. Then at time two, uh, token market opens again. The entrepreneur will sell a quantity that he chooses, Q2. The providers are now also participating in the token market and selling the Q1 that they got in the previous uh, period. Okay, and this is basically what uh, hurts the monopoly power of the uh, entrepreneur at that point. Uh, the consumers will buy uh, tokens for a price of P2. Uh, consumers will get the service, providers will receive tokens, consumers consume, and then providers redeem the tokens uh, for C. Okay. That's basically how we think about the, yeah. the timeline. Can I, can I just uh, ask a related question here? Yes. Um, so here Q2 is, Kind of anticipated in equilibrium, but it's not committed to. Um, right. Yes. So mm -hmm. the commitment is really on this rule of one token for one service. Yes. Um, but not on the supply uh, in terms of, which could also alter the, the worth of 
Yes, that, that's service. right. That's right. Yes. Okay. So, so, so I guess don't the, commit on the supply. Uh, and, and I will argue that committing on the supply could become a problem once you allow for um, stochastic demand, uh, which we do later in, in the paper. Yeah, so, so in that sense, I think that the, you know, the simple uh, coin make mechanism where the only thing you commit on is sort of the exchange rate between the coin and uh, the service uh, is, is probably an easy way to achieve yeah, I, I guess this is related to uh, Martin's uh, question as well. Mm -hmm. um, he was asking, you know, in an example around Uber or even some uh, blockchain-based startups, what stops the platform from charging a margin on the app after selling the tokens? It's related to how, how we enforce this commitment uh, mm -hmm. to some extent. Yes. So, so, so basically you say that um, in, in the, in addition to paying for the service with uh, a coin, a token, there will also be some other price. So you know, Uber will charge sort of the users uh, an additional price, right? So I, I guess the assumption is that you know the initial commitment is basically that the only way uh, trade is going to happen in this environment is through those tokens, uh, and whatever. Changing that is kind of like changing your bylaws in, in some sense. So I, I, I would argue this is probably a reasonable um, assumption about the commitment uh, ability. I also have a question. Yes. How, how are prices P1 and P2 set? Um, so they are uh, set uh, basically in equilibrium, right? There is uh, So there will be demand for the coins coming from consumers. And then there is the supply of coins. Okay, so uh, in period, basically what will happen is, you will see in a second, in period one, uh, the entrepreneur is going to choose to put alpha H tokens out there. So then the price, you basically get the sort of uh, those who value the service the highest, so the price will be set at VH. And then in period two, as you will see in a second, what will happen in equilibrium is you have the initial alpha H tokens, but the monopolist is going to put an additional tokens. So the price is going to go down to uh, VL, basically. Okay. Okay. Um, Itai, Itai. Yes. Can I, uh, so I kept wondering that the entrepreneur would try not to use tokens. If that's the case, because what, when, when will it? So, it not be good? Uh, so you showed us that uh, in the beginning that uh, it's optimal for them to just to serve the high type. So, yes. Right? And then, then now, then you you basically selling some token, and then tomorrow you you kind of introduce some competitor competitor to himself. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the profit maximization, the entrepreneur will get hurt. Yes. A that's am true. I right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So, so, so then the question... Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're okay. saying basically going back to time zero, if the entrepreneur can choose between mm -hmm. operating as a monopolist, like I showed in the beginning, yeah. yes. versus, versus having this sort of token yeah. mechanism, he would choose to be a monopolist. And, and that's right. Uh, he yes, I see. So initially, when I thinking through what you were saying, seems mm -hmm. like you are saying using token is to commit, like it's a commitment me mechanism. But actually, right. it's the opposite of a commitment mechanism. Is that right? No, it's it's a once you have the tokens, it's basically uh, you're tying your hand to be competitive uh, in the future. Okay. The question is, what will cause you? to tie your hands yes. <laughs> in that yeah. way. And, okay. and we'll talk about that later uh, in, I see. in the I paper. See. Um, but, okay. I, I, think I got maybe, it, I got it. I think it's a very intriguing idea. I, mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. Okay, I will wait. I mean, I mean, the, 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 yes, yeah, so just to give you a gist of it, you know, it could be um, that having some kind of policy uh, saying that when you have this kind of platforms, you have to operate them with tokens. Maybe that's the way to go. So you need some policy intervention to enforce that. 
it could, and there are two other things that we explore later in the paper that could generate this without policy. One is in case um, the entrepreneur raises capital for this project from future consumers, and they somehow uh, feel that they are pivotal to the success of this project. Mm -hmm. Then basically you can have them internalize this and um, mm -hmm. the, the optimal will be enforced that way. Um, it, so you can think about some kind of a crowdfunding uh, mechanism uh, for that. That's yeah, or, uh, or uh, similar to antitrust policies, you know, the regulator says, if you want to do this kind of thing, uh, it is also important to have commitment uh, of the type, even though it is not optimal for the monopolist to get into this regime of committing, it could be that there is a policy not unlike some antitrust policy where, you know, if you have to operate, you have to do this uh, commitment to be competitive. And, and yeah, that could be a policy response or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Uh, and and the, the other thing that we say is, you know, later in the paper, we, we say, suppose that there is the possibility that a second platform will come in uh, and then there will be competition between the platforms. Having a token uh, market in place that reduces your monopoly power going forward will prevent the second uh, platform from uh, stepping in. So th those are sort of three different answers that we give as to what could cause this to emerge. Either there is exogenous policy that enforces this or there, uh, there is a fundraising uh, mechanism that goes through uh, the consumers or uh, there is a competitive pressure that uh, across platforms that leads to that. But I'll, I'll get to that maybe towards the end. Uh, I guess I'm running a bit uh, short on time. Um, so, um, so basically what we show is that uh, once you introduce the tokens, um, what will happen in the market in equilibrium will be that the uh, entrepreneur will release alpha H tokens at uh, time one and will sell the service at, at this price, uh, VH. And then at time two, uh, the entrepreneur will release the rest of the tokens, uh, alpha L, and the price will drop to VL. So essentially at time two, you uh, go back to the competitive uh, solution. Um, and you may ask, can I, yes. Can I ask a question, a uh, very short one. So what happens here at the end of the game? Uh, why would the producers uh, agree to accept the tokens in the second period? Is there a fixed price at the end? Yeah, so we say uh, that one of the things that I said in the beginning as part of the setup of this mechanism is that the entrepreneur uh, commits to redeem uh, the tokens at the end for a price of C. Okay. okay, that's important. Otherwise, when you deal with a finite horizon, that's important. And, and just to see why the entrepreneur chooses to, to do that, um, you know, you, you, you need, so, so essentially why we have uh, the quantity of tokens alpha H and then alpha L, um, you know, focus for a second, which we do in some parts of the paper on uh, no uh, discount, no discount factor. So, uh, you know, uh, you value today's money the same as you value uh, next period's uh, money. Um, if the entrepreneur chose to keep the price at alpha H, um, uh, sorry, at VH in both periods, that means releasing a total amount of coins, which is alpha H, um, which basically limits your profit to alpha H times VH minus C over the two periods. And you're always better off releasing those additional tokens and increasing your profit, okay? Um, and then uh, same thing, if you wanted um, to keep the price at VL across both periods, it will limit your profit across the two periods to VL minus C, and you're always better off getting at least uh, some chunk of the profits at, at the higher price uh, VH, uh, your profits will increase. So in some sense, uh, the way that you sort of release uh, coins sequentially uh, basically implies that you would always choose to release uh, a chunk of coins initially getting the high price and then 
you will release the rest uh, getting uh, the, lower, uh, the lower price, okay? Um, the way to think about it, it's essentially limited stock of market power. Each time the entrepreneur wants to monetize, it increases the competition in subsequent uh, periods. Um, and eventually, at the sec here at the second period, um, the surplus is gonna be maximized. I'll show you in the general model, eventually at some point in the future, we, we get to the competitive uh, equilibrium. Um, yes, uh, so I think I talked about all these things. So maybe we can pause here for uh, Q&A, uh, Will. Yes, so we, we do have a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, I'm just going to uh, unmute uh, Martin, Justin, and uh, Simon so that you can pose the question directly. I think Martin is already unmuted. Thank you, uh, Bill. Yes, it, I, it's a little bit of follow-up question to kind of the, the, the question that are raised earlier, but it's also, it's kind of, it seems important from the um, kind of, to what extent it really is a commitment to use the tokens. So one of the things you, so my, my first question would be like, what stops Uber in going back to the Uber example for not kind of charging a margin uh, once Uber has sold these tokens? And then kind of, I think your response was more or less, well, it's really that Uber has just accepted to just accept only those tokens. But then still, if I think about the current Uber app, it really doesn't, matter how I pay, but they can always charge a 15% margin and just say like from any incoming resources, we get 15% uh, or, or whatever their current price is. So I wonder like how would that change with when you go to tokens, could they not do the same thing with tokens saying from for every 100 tokens, we get 15? Yes. Um, you know, I think it goes back to the question, as, as you said, about what exactly you can commit on. I, I would say, and you know, I, I, I will think about it some more, but my immediate reaction is, I think it is reasonable to say that they set up the system such that the only form of payments for these uh, services, um, you know, everything happens through coins, essentially. Um, so that, that would be my answer. And, and I think to me, that seems like a sensible assumption to make about the, the commitment the commitment ability, but uh, cer certainly deserves more thought. Maybe to to be more precise about what exactly this this, this is. Yes, it it seems like on top of that you need a commitment that they cannot kind of charge part of the incoming tokens, so so that kind of all the tokens go to whoever's providing the service. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, I, if I if I may, I just add the remark there. Uh, it kind of depends on what we can code in. If at some point Uber cars have this, you know, IoT device that digitally one token uh, has to deliver one ride, uh, otherwise the car is locked, something like that, that would be a form of enforcement. At the moment, it's kind mm -hmm. of hard to think of non-digital off-chain um, kind of commitment or, or contracts in that form. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a design question mm -hmm. right um yes you, you said you unmuted uh, simon as well or? yes yeah thank you very much for this very interesting uh, paper and this interesting presentation so my only question would be would the results still go through if you remove this let's say this nominal pack that like the price of one ride is packed to one token because oftentimes like the pack is in terms of dollar values. Yes, uh, so the result depends on, on this assumption. Um, yeah. and, and we show in the paper that if you allow the exchange rate, if you want, between tokens and services to float, uh, then you go back to sort of uh, the, the, the market power goes back to, to the entrepreneur, which I think is an interesting uh, yeah. result in and of itself. Um, but, but it kind of shows you that in order to benefit from this, you need to sort of fix that particular thing. Um, I see. So like, if you were to let it float, then the, I suppose then the 
platform would also not issue tokens once you go into period two. Right, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so should I uh, continue, uh, Will? Uh, I think Jason had a question. Do you want to ask? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I think Itai basically has already answered that in his third comment to Jugo, response to Jugo's question. I was just thinking about what what's the platform's incentive of issuing tokens. I was thinking about if there are happen to be two startups that one is issuing token, another is not issuing token. If consumers are smart, they may foresee that the one that issued token may be committed to competition, so they may be more inclined to use the one that issued token. So maybe that equilibrium one. Right. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Catherine has a question too. Catherine, do you want to? Yep. Uh, very interesting. So I was uh, thinking while you were presenting that there is like a parallel to also things like airline tickets because they seem to have very similar properties that I have a token, my airline ticket, which gives me a right to one seat. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about like the same sort of implications in uh, making the tickets resellable because it looks like airlines don't want to make it. So like, uh, which is kind of <laughs> related to the earlier questions and why would they want to hurt themselves? And what do you think of this parallel? Yeah. Right, no, that, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting uh, point. Yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, so certainly, I, I think that is a, a reason why they don't want to do it, um, or they don't want to have those tickets saleable, in the sense that they are better off with the market power in, in place. So, yes, I think that's Great. Uh, yeah, let's let's move on, and uh, we'll have uh, one more. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, if you followed the example, I think you get the gist, but I, I, I think there is still a lot more uh, in the paper. So let me quickly review some of the interesting uh, uh, material that, that we have. And, and you, you know, in, in most of the paper, we look at a general model. Uh, so you have N periods. Again, you have the same three types of risk neutral long-lived agents um, with discount factor delta. So it doesn't have to be one. Uh, the entrepreneur develops the platform. Uh, then you have the competitive providers who produce a service at a cost C and you have heterogeneous consumers who value the, the service. Um, the platform is initiated at time one by the entrepreneur. Each token can be exchanged for one unit of the service. Each period T, there is a market for tokens in which tokens are bought and sold for an endogenous price of uh, PT. Uh, and the service providers can redeem tokens with entrepreneur for price uh, uh, C uh, at, at the end, okay? Um, now, we think about a unit mass uh, between zero and one of consumers who are long lived. Um, and you can think about uh, having M types of consumers um, you know, you can think about M being below N, where N is the number of periods, although that doesn't matter uh, too much. Uh, consumer of type I values a unit of the service at UI. UI is somewhere between U lower bar and U upper bar, and U lower bar is above C, okay? Um, and uh, we say that the mass of type I consumers is equal to alpha I, where the sum uh, across uh, all alpha i from one to m is equal to, to one. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the general uh, setup. And, and the result that we get here is that there will be a unique equilibrium in which the total quantity of tokens released increases over time and the price of tokens decreases over time with m different consumers type, the competitive outcome is achieved after m periods if delta is equal to one. So basically, like in the two period model, it was achieved after two periods with two types here, uh, it will be achieved after M periods when you have M types. Uh, if Delta is smaller than one, uh, things get a little more tricky and then the competitive outcome will be achieved perhaps sooner. Okay, because you can imagine when Delta is smaller than one, then the entrepreneur has an additional pressure to release tokens more quickly uh, which depletes uh, the market power more quickly. So you can say in general that uh, the competitive outcome will definitely be achieved here. Uh, and 
the longest that it will take it to be achieved is M, M period. Okay. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the general uh, result. Now, let, let me go into some of the issues that were raised before as to, um, you know, how could this be implemented? Will the entrepreneur choose to set up this token mechanism, token market, uh, or will the entrepreneur uh, choose to remain as a monopolist? Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we say basically three things. One, which is simple, is you can do it through policy. So if you're a policymaker and you're worried about this market concentration in, in platforms, but you still want them to operate and uh, have the network benefits, uh, then one way to do it would be to say that once they operate, they have to do it with uh, tokens. And this will uh, ensure that their market power is depleted over time. But there are also ways in which this could be achieved without policy intervention. And we explore two of them. Um, one is um, if the entrepreneur raises tokens through crowdfunding. Um, but of course, as I mentioned before, what will be important for this is that uh, those investors, future consumers who are funding uh, the platform will have to think that they are pivotal which I think is a, is a feature that, that is uh, quite common uh, in the crowdfunding uh, mechanisms. Uh, and then the second is uh, through competition. And then we explore a setup where you have uh, two platforms that are competing with uh, each other. Um, in some sense, if you have a platform that operates through tokens, then uh, this will not create the pressure to, uh, for the other platform to, to arise. So essentially the threat of entry here uh, uh, pushes you to do it. Okay. So think for a second about this uh, financing uh, mechanism. Uh, let's say that there is a fundraising uh, stage. The entrepreneur needs to raise I at time one before the platform starts. He can choose to operate as a monopolist or issue uh, tokens. Uh, and operate through this uh, token mechanism that I just described. Uh, the entrepreneur can raise money uh, from uh, outsiders or consumers, and the outside option is storage with return of one. Okay. So if you uh, operate as a monopolist um, and you need to raise I, you will need to give a, a share SM to the investors such that they break even. So basically, uh, SM will be I over the future profits of the monopolist. Okay. If you operate as uh, an entrepreneur with a token mechanism, you will need to give a, a share SE, um, where the share is the investment I over the future uh, profits that you make through an ICO. Okay. It's not difficult to show here that uh, SM will be smaller than SE. And overall, the entrepreneur, by choosing to be a monopolist, will be giving up a smaller share of a larger pie and will choose to be a monopolist. How do you break that? You break that if you raise money from future consumers in a mechanism that uh, makes them pivotal. Okay. In this case, uh, what, what, what will happen is you will need to give them a share SE of the future uh, profits. Okay, so we are thinking about uh, the population of consumers who value the service uh, at a high level, uh, I alpha H, they are uh, financing the project. You will need to give them a share SE of the future profits. They are financing the investment, but they also internalize the future surplus that they're getting from this um, system coming uh, to, to life, okay? Because of this, then the share that you need to give them becomes lower. And we show that you know, for a, a big uh, range of parameters, basically you will choose to uh, operate uh, with an ICO uh, through this uh, crowdfunding uh, mechanism. Okay, So raising the capital from uh, future uh, consumers. There is a strong uh, parallel here to um, the way that the ICO uh, mechanism uh, works, okay? So instead, basically what, what, what we show in the paper is um, you can basically sell tokens instead of selling equity 
to the investors who are future consumers. You sell them tokens. Um, from their point of view, the value of those tokens is VH, which is what they get for the service in the first period, and then VH minus VL, which is the surplus that they get in the second uh, period. Okay, so this is what they are willing to pay for a token. And if they are willing to pay for a token, then it's the same thing as what I described before. The entrepreneur under a good range of parameters will choose to operate as uh, sort of this token mechanism rather than being a, a monopolist. And, and again, I wanna make clear what is critical here is that you uh, introduce a mechanism of financing whereby uh, those who finance you are the future consumers and they internalize uh, their effect on uh, this uh, platform coming coming to life. Itai, if, if, if I may, it's, the, the, the assumption that um, investors are pivotal is, is a bit hard to swallow, but maybe if we make a, a weaker assumption, for example, they're pivotal with some probability, then the result also obtains, or am I wrong? I, I believe so, yes. Um, yes. Um, uh, I, I think so, yes. I, I mean, we have, we, we should uh, probably do it explicitly in the paper, but, but I, I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other mechanism that I mentioned that could um, help this kind of arrangement uh, come, come to life without uh, external policy is through competition. And I guess I'm running short on time, so I will very quickly tell you how we generalize the paper to introduce uh, competition. Um, so we basically say that, um, let's say that there are potentially two platforms, and now uh, the cost of producing uh, the service is going to depend on how many people you're uh, providing this service to, and C prime alpha is uh, negative. Okay, so, so the idea here is there is this sort of network uh, effect, okay? The more people are waiting for your uh, rides, the more efficiently you, you, can, you can do that. You don't need to wait that long and, and so on, okay? Um, so with this in mind, you can now explore an equilibrium with two competing uh, platforms. Uh, compare it to one platform, which is a monopolist, and also to one platform, which acts as uh, sort of a coin-based uh, system, okay? And, um, you know, the, the results that we get here, if a platform exchange exhibits network uh, effects, then the welfare under a tokenized platform in the long run is always going to be higher than that under two competing standard platforms, okay? Um, in some sense, uh, what, what, is, what is going on here is uh, you can think about the price that the monopoly sets in, in the long run. The price on a competitive, on two competing platforms in the long run is PC, and the price on uh, an entrepreneur uh, token-based uh, system. And there is this relationship between them. PM is greater than PC is greater than PE, okay? Um, and, and the reason is the competition will reduce uh, the price, okay, uh, for obvious reasons. But you can do even better if you maintain everyone within the same platform, but have this token uh, mechanism that commits you to competition within the, the platform uh, in the long run, okay? Um, and, and again, the reason is the efficiency uh, from having a larger, a larger scale. And, and basically what we show in the paper is that, you know, PC is smaller than PM. So if you are operating as a monopolist, there will be a threat of, of entry. Um, but uh, PE is below PC, so in some sense, if you're operating as a token-based uh, platform, there will be no uh, threat of, of entry. So that could, could be another thing that could generate this kind of mechanism uh, to, to emerge. Um, I guess I'm, yeah, let, let me just say a few minutes uh, for... Yes, so I'll, I'll just say that we deal with uh, demand uncertainties and long-run growth in, in demand and... Yes, uh, I think uh, that's it. So I, I'm happy to take more questions. Itai, I, yes. I could. So I kept wondering that you started with this platform 
So in some sense, in a lot of uh, most uh, salient platforms where it's like, you know, this monopoly problem and all these things, they, they don't emphasize this payment at all. Think about the Ali uh, in China. Um, like the way that, that, that really the crucial part is that they, in, they actually get into this, uh, uh, the issue that you are, you are identifying in the sense that uh, once they make some infrastructure investment, right? Then later on, there's a lot of uh, um, some small entrepreneurs coming in to also open their shops. And then they, there's a lot of competition going on in the ecosystem. And uh, in what way that are you thinking that this payment or the token, I understand that this is a utility based. How do I put in, like using your theory to give some insight on the other much bigger market that uh, we, we typically put a lot of a full focus on in terms of the competition, where, uh, consumer welfare, those things. So, so again, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. You're saying that if you're thinking about Alibaba, the thing that you think distinguishes it from what I presented is that you have a variety of producers who are competing with, with each other or what? What, what, what is the thing that you... They, in, in the early situation, I don't think ever people think about the payment, whether mm -hmm. you're issuing tokens so that you can only use this part of a token in the Alibaba ecosystem. Every yeah. payment is typical you know, currency. It's like it's just a fiat currency. Yes, right. right? Yes, what so, they are getting into is the idea that how much infrastructure they have to put in, let's say that they can handle... 10,000 transactions, they can handle 1 billion transactions, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think about it as there is a little bit of a timing issue, timing consistency or commitment issue is that once they establish this big uh, infrastructure, they kind of like going to the next period that they have to uh, invite more <laughs> firms coming in and then you have this uh, competition going on. Mm -hmm. in second period uh, transaction uh, in the second period equilibrium yes you know so, mm -hmm. I, I i mean obviously the the, the world is is complicated as, as, and has a lot of things going on but 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 i guess one thing that i would like to emphasize is i i think these types of platforms naturally lead themselves to being in, in a monopolist position uh one way or, or another, because they are controlling sort of the, the whole matching between consumers and, and producers. And, you know, if this is the only game in, in town and everyone goes there to get those services, then it's very, you know, that, then you end up being a, a monopolist. And, and I'm thinking um, that these coins are, are essentially a natural way to, to break that, because if you commit ex ante that the only way to pay for those services would be uh, through those coins. And you, are, you have to release those coins in order to make some profits initially. Um, then uh, you, th this monopolist position will not uh, arise. Now, now, I think maybe what you're saying is that there are other ways to, other things to, to consider with sort of other dimensions of competition and, and so it's on. A little bit of that. Yes, mm -hmm. which, which, yes, I, I agree. Uh, although, but I, but I will say, I, I think the, this is, this problem of market power is very pervasive and may be even more pervasive in this types of, of platforms uh, going forward. Um, I have, I also have a little thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really love it. It was great. It's, we, you give a model of why token are used as opposed to using equity, which is, I think, very important. I, I was thinking um, it's the, the relationship with the cost conjecture is very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, you there is something very similar both in your paper and in, and in the cost conjecture, which is that the monopolist is competing with himself. Yes, and that brings prices towards competitive level. Right. But there are but there are differences, and I can see two differences. One is, as you said, you don't have durable goods; you have uh, uh, you know services. And the other thing is you have a, a finite horizon. 
Mm -hmm. uh, while you know, for the cause conjecture, we need an infinite horizon. And I, I, I think that maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe it is because you have services as opposed to durable goods that you get the result in a finite horizon in contrast with cause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll, 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 I'll have to think about that. Um, yeah, it could, it could be. Um, Maybe that, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting point. Yes, I'll, I'll have to think about that. It, it, it kind of also matters that the, uh, uh, well, there's a one token, one service kind of fixed pack. If that's relaxed, then the marginal guy and the average uh, consumer's uh, surplus would be, would be different. That's going to break uh, Coase's uh, result as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Kind of related to Bruno's earlier que uh, question about uh, uh, kind of airdropping uh, tokens to the uh, consumers through, through crowdfunding. Is it uh, very crucial that these are allocated to the consumers? Because in practice, we do see like a A16Z or a Convex Ventures stepping in, especially when the ICO is big, to purchase a big chunk. Maybe they are getting a better deal uh, through some pre-sale, uh, mm -hmm. but they are kind of intermediate. It, it's kind of outside the scope of the current paper, but in practice, uh, these big institutions, whether we call it speculators or intermediaries, they do step in and uh, yeah. kind of, uh, take, take uh, some liquidity out of the, the planned uh, yes. implementation. You know, I mean, I, I think it can probably work in that setting as well. Um, we will need to think about the exact mechanism of, you know, those institutions buying the tokens and then they are selling them to consumers and, and, and maybe realizing some of the benefits from the future consumers that, that way. Um, I think as long as they get to internalize the future benefit of having this greater surplus, then uh, this thing will, will work. Yeah. Um, I think we kind of, uh, uh, we are reasonably on time, uh, running over a few minutes <laughs> because I took up a few yes. minutes in the introduction. What I'll do is um, I'm going to officially conclude the session and stop the recording, but I do encourage, you know, uh, people who have uh, more questions and uh, you know, or, or you just want to hang out to stay a few more minutes to, to chat about the paper. Um, but uh, a reminder is uh, we do have uh, on March 18th, uh, a symposium uh, coming up as well. So hope uh, many of you would be able to attend. So with that, uh, let's, let's all thank uh, Itai and I'm going to conclude the webinar uh, officially. Yeah, thank you very much.